who qualifies to go to heaven? We claim to be Christians and to be people who have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But do we qualify to go to heaven? We are looking in the Psalter, Psalms 15. It reveals the qualities of people who claim or who will dwell in the holy mountains and will dwell in the presence of the Lord forever and ever. Today is a session on the Psalter. We're just looking at Psalms 15. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The answer, it is the one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps on and off even when it hurts and does not change their mind. He who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent, whoever does these things will never be shaken. The first verse gives us a, a question. It's kind of a question. There are actually two questions. The first one is who may dwell in the sacred tent? You can also talk, call it a tabernacle. And they, the second question still has to do with someone who lives in the presence of the Lord. But the question is now, who may live on your holy mountain? It's actually a, a question that refers to the presence of the Lord. This brings two things or two issues that we need to attend or to understand. The first thing is that what is, the, what is it that draws people into the tabernacle or the sacred, the sacred tent? What draws them there? What will make someone to ask such a question? It means there's something interesting. The second part that we can look at is that the, the fact that the question is who may dwell, it means that not everybody may dwell in the presence of the Lord or in the tabernacle. Not everyone. So there are some things or some qualifications that one has to meet to be regarded as a person who can be in the presence of the Lord forever. I will first talk about the first part, which is what draws people to the tabernacle. If you read the book of Exodus, there's quite a lot God is speaking about the tabernacle. There is a lot that he says uh, in terms of the instructions, how it should be made and what happens and what happens in that. But I want to dwell in the things that what used to happen in the tabernacle. In the book of Exodus chapter 29, verse 42 and 30, 36, you get to understand that this is where Israel will meet God. Moses will go to the tabernacle and meet God face to face. This is where the high priest will communicate with God. As you know that there was uh, the tent, the outer part, and then there's the holy place, and there's the holy of holies where only the priest would go in there once a year. So it was a place where they would meet God. Time and again we hear that the cloud which represented the presence of the Lord will be on the, tab uh, on the tabernacle or in the tent where the presence of the, of the Lord was there. They would also offer sacrifices in the tabernacle. They would uh, sacrifices that include offering, it also atonement, and all those things. But it was where they could connect with their God. It was an important place in their life. It was a secret place, a place where you would go and inquire of what the Lord wants to do or what the Lord is saying in a particular situation, just to get the presence of the Lord was in the tabernacle. So it is where, it is actually a, a very important place, uh, place, I'm sorry, a place for the Israelite. It was a very important place where the presence of the Lord was. Psalm 1611 says, it is the presence of the Lord, sorry, states that in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy with eternal 
pleasures. In other words, in that tent, in the presence of the Lord, where you feel the warmth and the greatness of the Lord, you will feel the pleasure and the joy which is eternal. So it is a place that is so good. But in our times now, we cannot maybe refer to a tabernacle or a church or whatever, but the tabernacle now, we refer in this case, will refer to the presence of the Lord forever. Who can go to heaven and be a Christian? Or I will say, who qualifies to go to heaven and stay with God forever? So I would say, these are some of the characteristics of things that have to be found in the life of a person who claims to be a Christian. These are things that need to be found in our lives as people who claim to love the Lord Jesus Christ today and people who claim to be destined for heaven. If you don't have these characteristics, it means you may not live in the holy mountain. Jesus says in the book of John, I'm going to the Father to prepare a place for you. That is the place this this chapter is talking about the dwelling place where there is this presence of the Lord. Now, I want us to look at the things that are there. The first one is that the person has to be the one whose walk is blameless. Someone without a blame. We read in the book of Genesis chapter 6 verse 9 of a man who was blameless and that man was Noah. He walked faithfully before God. In the book of Genesis chapter 17 verse 1, we learn that God demands, this, demands blamelessness. He says to Abraham, walk before me faithfully and blameless. So as people who want to go to heaven, who are expecting to go to heaven when we pass from this earth and want to stay in the presence of the Lord, we should be blameless. Now, what is this thing we are talking about being blameless? We are talking of people of integrity. People who do not indulge in things that bring about guilt. People who have strong moral principles. People who fear God rather than man. These are people that will ensure that the will of God or God's instruction is activated or is, 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 is adhered to even in times that are not favorable. They stick to what the word of the Lord says rather than what people say. These are people without fault, fault sorry, people without fault, innocent of wrongdoing and without guilt before people. Those are the people who qualify to go to heaven, blameless, people of integrity, people who are not evildoers. As human beings, we need to understand that God is, is there, he's omnipresent. As I'm speaking here, God is here. If you have that principle in your life where you understand that the Lord God is present in every situation or any place you may be and he sees everything that you do and you will be accountable for everything that you do, your way of life will change. You see, Luke 8 verse 17 says, There is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought into the open. Everything that we do is known by God. So when God says we should be blameless, we should turn or change our focus from people to God. Being blameless before God, not human beings. If you can go to the story of Joseph, he, was, he ran away from Potiphar's wife because he was afraid you know, or because he feared God. He honored God. He did not want to be someone who is to blame. But he wanted to be blameless before God, to maintain his integrity, to maintain his relationship with God. If we want to go to heaven, let us be people who fear God rather than men. 
If any situation that we confront or that we get into as Christians makes us to compromise the standards of God, please take the standards of God. I remember in one of these professional qualifications, one of the modules that we did was on ethics. One of the ethics said, if of the statement was, if the rule in that country does not say anything about this issue, whatever ethical issue that needs to be addressed, you have to take what their rule says. And if the ethical uh, the, 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 the inst- or the, the rule in the country is of no, is a little bit more relaxed compared to theirs, you stick to theirs. Because what was important is that you make sure that you, you, you remain in the right spot according to their profession. It is what to have to do as Christians. Regardless of the situation we are in, we have to maintain God's standards such that we can be blameless before God. Please do not compromise your Christian position or your Christianity for any gain. Just because you say, I will gain whatever I'm gaining and continue and confess my sins and then go back to God. That is not the gospel that is being preached by the Bible or what the Bible says. That is not the gospel. But we have to be people that maintain our godly standards. The other thing it says, it's one who does what is righteous. People who do what is righteous. If we come to talk about righteousness, we can split it into two. We can define it in two ways. The first one will be, there is the righteousness that we get or we receive when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ. This is brought about with the Holy Spirit. We become, we get into the right standing with God and God view us, views us as righteous. This is one part of the righteousness. But the other righteousness that I want to talk about, it includes the good deeds as Christians. These are deeds that we do with the people around us. One of the principles of Christianity is that as Christians, we should reflect the character of God. People should should see Christ, see the acts of God in whatever we do. So what or one of these acts that should reveal God's goodness is the righteous act. Christians are expected to be trustworthy. We are expected to do things or make the right decisions in whenever we are supposed to make a decision as Christians. We are supposed to do the righteous uh, acts of giving to the needy, the righteous acts of being a responsible father if you are a man, a, a husband, or a responsible mother if you are a woman. Those righteous acts that reveal the goodness of God. Being a trustworthy person as a Christian. Good, righteous acts that we are expected to do as Christians. One of the requirements for people to stay in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ is that we should be righteous. The third one is still on verse 2. Is that we need to speak the truth. Listen, speak the truth. Not in word of mouth. Only but in their hearts. You speak it from your heart. I don't know how I can explain this, but this reveals something. I might be speaking here, but my heart is saying something different. A person might say something, they say, talk is cheap. This is what we say, umlomo lishoba elektipungen. You can use your mouth to speak what you don't say from your heart. But these are people who are sincere. They speak what is from the heart. First Thessalonians chapter 3 uh, from verse 5 to from verse 3 to 5 reveals that God examines our hearts. He examines that. So God knows what we say deep 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 down in our hearts rather than what we say with our mouths. So we should learn as Christians to be people who are sincere. 
Don't say something with your mouth and your heart is saying something different. Say what you say, let it be from your heart. You should not say things to impress a friend or impress the authorities or to impress whoever you think needs to be impressed. Saying something with your mouth that is different from what your heart is saying. You need to be careful. If you want to go to heaven, you must be a sincere person. What you say should be what is from your heart. Verse 3, it focuses on our relationships with other people. He says, whose tongue utters no slander, treat each other fairly, and says no cruel things. It is a person of integrity, integrity who speaks the truth, who will not slander with the tongue. When we are talking about slandering, it's somebody who makes a false allegation against someone. You're just saying something which is not true for whatever gain you want. If you speak something that is not true about someone with the intent of damaging this per- that person's reputation, because the intent is also important, because you speak evil with the intent to damage the person for whatever reason that you have. God hates that. You cannot, don't count yourself as a person who's going to heaven if you're acting that way. The Bible talks about a neighbor. A neighbor is is not necessarily someone who stays next to you where you stay, but it is every person. We should treat every person with dignity. Respect each person. Don't take advantage of a person. Don't unfairly treat a person. As human beings, we need to be considerate of the other people. Be considerate of the feelings of the other person. The best way to think of it is like this. Whenever you are doing something to someone, think about this. What if it were me? If this was done to me, how would I react? That will help you to understand that you should not treat anybody unfairly. The Bible says that we should respect people. Don't take advantage of another person. It might be because the person is poor, is less educated, or whatever reason that you can see to give you an upper hand against that person. The other thing, it talks of a slur. There should be no allegations about someone that is likely to insult or damage their reputation. Most of these things we see in the workplace, it can happen maybe in society, in communities, whatever, but this is common in, in, in workplaces where people want a promotion speaking something that is not right about another person. It, the Bible condemns that. You see, we are so much of hypocrites that some, maybe in my culture, some people, they don't like maybe who is a leader or whoever is leading, maybe it's a church or a group or whatever, but they, they still go there. They are speaking or their talks are not good about the person, but they still, Sunday, they still go to the church. Oh, holy God, holy God, and they expect to go to heaven. The Bible tells us that person does not qualify. Saints, let's be careful. When you call or whatever you discuss in whatever place in a restaurant, what is it that you are saying? Is it necessary to discuss those issues about that person? And if if it's necessary, what is the approach? What is the approach? Are you doing it in a way that is going to be constructive or you are just destroying everything. We need to be careful. If you're still doing that for the sake of tarnishing the name of that person, for whatever good you see in it, sometimes there's actually not even any good you see, but you just like to do it. 
Don't count yourself as someone who qualifies to go to heaven, to dwell in the presence of the Lord. God wants us to respect each other. God wants us to speak good about that other person. If it's not necessary to discuss an issue about someone, don't. Amen to that. The other thing that we see is, construct, is basically contrasting in verse 4. The Bible talks about they, they, this, this kind of person who qualifies. They take no worth on morally bad people. In other words, they don't value people who are morally wrong. You see, these days we live in this television, this social media. People post whatever they post on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, wherever they are. Some of these people will know that their life or their conduct is morally bad. But because we know they are rich, or because they are famous, or because they, they, can, they are influential in society, we seem to be attracted to them. The Bible condemns that. You should not take worth. Don't give them worth. Don't, don't, don't say, this is my idol, idol, because that's the talk these days. This is my idol, or this is my, to those who use the, 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 the church language, this is my spiritual father. You know very well the pastor is not a good one in terms of his works. They don't portray a Christian life. Or whoever, it's an artist who sings, or whatever, you, you think, this is, I want to follow this person. But you know he's morally wrong. The Bible condemn, condemns that. We should not put value take worth in those kind of people. We need to be careful. Young people, be careful of who you follow in terms of musicians, in terms of your, your, your model. Those idols that you think, ah, I want to be like that kind of a person. You know maybe this person is a drug addict or whatever, he's a homosexual or whatever thing that is against the Bible and you follow that person. You put words and you say, this is what I want to be. The Bible condemns that. Now, it says, on the other part, contrary to the person who is vile, it says, but honors those who fear the Lord. But honors those who fear the Lord. If we can uh, read on that, that person, a Christian brother, a Christian sister, somebody who is a Christian who fear the Lord, we should give them reverence and esteem them as our, our fathers and our sisters, our mothers in the, in the Lord. Have that fellowship. Honor that person. We can attach to those people because they fear the Lord God. Do not attach to a person who is morally bad. This is what the verse is saying. People who are going to get to heaven are those who associate with those who fear God. Those who will just stick, uh, you, you will make friendship and friends and uh, uh, spiritual fathers, spiritual mothers. I mean, you have a Christian family of believers. Those are people who fear the Lord. The Bible warns us as Christians, let us be friends with people who honor the Lord people who are Christians, who fear the Lord. Now, I go further. It says, He who keeps an oath, even when it hurts, and does not change their mind. This is a temptation. Uh, we have burning services in churches or wherever there are uh, donations, uh, you raise your hand, uh, whatever. And then immediately you have uh, said, I'm going to offer 10,000 uh, Malangeni or dollars, you have an accident or a housebreaking, you lose the money. You see that you, you didn't choose that you to be in an accident that requires that money that you thought we were going to offer or to give to whomever you, you thought to. You see, you are in a, in, a, in a very, very difficult situation. But the Bible says someone who keeps the oath, a person who wants to go to heaven, will continue to offer that money. It might not necessarily be that time, but 
he sticks to the obligation that I will give my money. I want to, us to read the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5. I'm going to read from verse 4 to verse 7. It talks about this. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vows. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. And do not protest to the temple messenger. My vows were sorry, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the works of your hand? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, fear God. There's a lot in what we've just read. But one of the things that we see here is that God takes no pleasure in a fool. So in other words, anyone who makes a pledge and does not fulfill it, it's a fool. Further, it also reveals that this person who does not keep his vow is regarded also as a sinner. It's a sin to make a vow and not fulfill. Yet we should know that it is not a sin not to make a vow. You can just keep quiet even if there are no donations everybody is offering. Don't make a pledge. Just do whatever you want. We are not forced to make a vow. But once you make it, you have to keep it. Now, the Bible says where we read in the book of in, in, in Psalms 15, it says, even if things don't go right, he keeps his oath even when it hurts. Even if it hurts, you need that money, but you still have to keep an oath. We have to keep our vows and fulfill them. We have to fulfill whatever we say, fulfilling our vows. If you fulfill your vows, you are someone who should think or you should count yourself as someone who is going to heaven. You cannot to go to heaven if you have made vows that you haven't kept. The last part is one that is a very controversial one. It's an ethical issue, but I want us to read it carefully. Who lends money to the poor without interest? Is it wrong to lend money to the poor? It's absolutely not right. It's not absolutely, sorry, it's absolutely not wrong. We have to give money to the poor, lend to them if they ask for a loan. But the difference is that you shouldn't uh, charge interest. One will argue that Deuteronomy 23 verse 19 when it says, do not charge a fellow Israel interest, whether on money or on food or on anything else they may earn interest. You can argue that this refers to a Christian. But here it says to the poor. It regardless of whether the person is a Christian or not a Christian. So you are not expected to charge interest in that uh, person. The other thing it says, these people, they do not accept a bribe. Exodus 20, 23 verse 8 commands us not to take a bribe. For it blinds the wise and prevents the words of the righteous. Now, we should not take a bribe. It's th th this part, verse, uh, is verse 5, is more about money. No charges of interest to the poor. And don't accept a bribe. Sometimes you say, no, this was just a token of appreciation. But it blinds the wise. If you're still taking bribes, whatever you just, however or whatever you say to justify your position, you do not qualify to be in the presence of the Lord that is according to the Bible, according to the verse that we read or to the psalm in Psalm 15. Don't take bribes and don't judge interest. As we come to a conclusion, there's quite a lot that the Lord has said about, about whatever your Christian walk, how you should deal with your life. The question is, after reading all this or after listening to the sermon, do you see yourself qualifying to be in the presence of the Lord? Do you see yourself qualifying to live in glory, 
if you still take bribes, if you still charge interest, if you still scandalize people's names and you talk all those evil things, if you still value people who do not fear God and hate those who are, let's say, Christians, you still speak evil about people with the intention of tarnishing their name, their reputation, don't count yourself as someone who's going to heaven. If you still walk in evil ways, in other words, you're still not blameless, don't regard yourself as a someone who's going to heaven. How is your walk with God? Some of these things I want to say, they are hard or not easy to implement in your life, but you have to do it bit by bit. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you eliminate those actions and those things that are not favorable before God. Things that will make you not to qualify to dwell in the sacred place or in the holy mountain. I know we, most of us, we claim to be Christians. I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, but how is the walk with the Lord? Are you doing these things? Are you listen? Because one of the things you should know is that the Holy Spirit concurs to this thing. Because if you accept Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into you. He will tell you even before you make that call, that don't make this call because you're going to say something that is wrong about this person and I don't like it. And it's up to you to make the decision whether to call or not. Even to take a bribe. There's also a no. There's always a no. You can say, no, no thanks my brother, don't do this. But it's up to you to accept it or not. So we have talked about these things. This psalm reveals the qualities we have to have to qualify for heaven. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word. Help my viewer, Father, to mend his ways so he qualifies or she qualifies to be in your presence forever and ever. Father, we give you all the glory and all the honor and I appreciate your word today in the name of Jesus Christ. We have come to the end of our session today. I believe God has spoken into your life in different ways. And God is saying there are things you have to stop doing and there are things you have to mend in your life. What is important is that you correct the situation. Don't listen to the word and just continue doing like as you did. If God has said something to you today, please correct that. I believe your life will be changed until we get to maturity in Christ. God bless you.